In 1972, when NASA took its last crew to the lunar surface, a cycle came to an end. The space race, which for years had electrified the planet, reached a kind of symbolic full stop. From then on, one question kept echoing. What would be the next logical destination for human exploration? The answer was obvious. Mars. Among our neighbors, it is the one that most resembles Earth in terms of potential habitability. And although it remains a harsh, cold, and dangerous place, it is still a paradise compared to Venus, with its global oven driven by a runaway greenhouse effect. But turning that desire into a crude mission involves a list of challenges, as long as the distance to get there, starting with the most basic of all, take people there and bring them back alive. The accidents with the space shuttles. Challenger and Columbia left lessons no one in the field dares to ignore. In space, almost worked can be fatal. For every flight, entire teams of engineers must anticipate thousands of different failure modes because any overlooked detail can turn into tragedy. And when the destination is Mars, the margin for error narrows even more. The enormous distance, communication delays, supply logistics, entry and exit through a temperamental atmosphere. It all adds up to make designing a safe spacecraft a monumental puzzle. There are, indeed, solid proposals on the table. SpaceX, for example, is the one that currently presents the most concrete plans to get there, even dreaming of the migration of hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million people in the coming decades. But for the first humans to find something beyond dust and wind when they land, a lot needs to be ready beforehand. And the only realistic way to prepare that ground is to put artificial intelligences and robots to work before we go. Even with all the progress in planning, the Martian dream remains at least 55 million kilometers away when we catch the best window between the planets. That window, by the way, only opens every two years when Earth and Mars reach the closest point in their orbits. Agencies take advantage of those moments to launch probes and rovers. With people on board, it would be the same only far more complex. Because close, on a cosmic scale, is still very far. The journey can exceed 250 days. We have never had a human being so far from home for so long. The psychological impact of living for months in a metal cylinder, with no outside to clear your head, and with the horizon line replaced by cabin lights, is no small matter. What happens to mood, sleep, motivation? Stress, anxiety, depression, and interpersonal conflicts stop being academic hypotheses and become operational risks. On Earth, you can take a walk around the block, vent to friends, choose a different environment. In an interplanetary vehicle, you don't have that luxury. The crew needs to operate like a single organism, direct communication, quick decision-making, and emotional control. All of that can be trained, of course, but we have no track record of a crewed mission of this magnitude to validate every human variable involved. And then there is microgravity. Images of floating astronauts are mesmerizing, but our bodies were sculpted over millions of years for 1G. Without the constant pull, the body adopts an implacable logic of economy. What isn't being used, it reduces. Muscles thin, Bones lose mineralization, and literally some of the calcium is filtered and eliminated. To mitigate this, those living on the International Space Station work up a sweat. On average, about two hours a day of resistance and aerobic exercise, religiously. Does it work? It helps a lot, but it doesn't bring the problem to zero. Imagine months like that then adapting to one-third of Earth's gravity on Mars, more months back in microgravity, and the final readaptation to 1G. The body will switch regimes several times, something medicine has not yet mapped in depth. But if there is one villain that outdoes all others in terms of danger and stubbornness, it is radiation. Space is full of it. The sun, a natural fusion reactor, bathes the solar system in a spectrum that ranges from visible light to X-rays and ultraviolet. In addition, it ejects energetic particles, protons, and atomic nuclei that, when passing through tissues, can cause acute radiation sickness, neurological damage, and, in the long term, increase the risk of cancer by fragmenting DNA. Here on Earth, we live inside an invisible shield, the magnetic field deflects much of that bombardment, and the atmosphere swallows what manages to pass. 
Outside this bubble, however, the story is different. On a trip to Mars, the accumulated dose can be hundreds of times higher than what we receive at sea level. Reinforce the shielding? It sounds simple, but it isn't. Materials that block radiation tend to be heavy, and every extra kilogram means more launch fuel, more cost, more complexity. Research is exploring creative solutions, tanks or inflatable bags filled with water, hydrogen-rich materials, and even the use of a dark fungus found in Chernobyl whose melanin absorbs radiation. The direction is clear. We need effective protection without making the total mass of the spacecraft unfeasible, and this is moving forward. Suppose we have conquered the 400-day marathon between outbound trip and operations, we arrive in Mars orbit, and we are ready to descend. That's when another boss appears. Landing on Mars is notoriously difficult. Historically, only about half of landing attempts have worked. The problem starts with the atmosphere, almost a hundred times thinner than ours, which doesn't hold the spacecraft the way Earth's air does, making parachutes less effective. Uncrewed missions have used combinations of heat shields, parachutes, retro rockets, and, in cases like Curiosity and Perseverance, even sky cranes for controlled touchdowns. Now put into that equation the mass of a crewed module with people, provisions, water, oxygen, tools, and life support systems. To slow all that with rockets, the fuel demand rises steeply, and fuel is heavy, which requires more fuel to carry the fuel, a cycle that can make the project impractical if it isn't well optimized. That's why no sensible plan calls for entering the atmosphere and descending on the first try with the main ship. The most prudent design envisions a phased architecture. A mothership remains in orbit as a base and safe harbor storing part of the supplies and the return capability, while cargo modules go down first, delivering habitats, solar arrays, equipment, and perhaps even propellant produced locally. The crew only lands last when everything has been checked and Martian weather gives the green light. This orbital stage has another advantage, observing dust storms, common and potentially devastating phenomena, and choosing the right moment to descend. Touching the ground, doesn't end the drama. Going outside without protection is out of the question. The Martian atmosphere is essentially carbon dioxide, about 95%, with traces of nitrogen and almost non-existent oxygen. The pressure is minimal, around 0.6 kilopascals versus more than 100 kilopascals on Earth. In that condition, gases trapped in body cavities expand, eardrums can rupture, and, in exposed areas, liquids begin to boil at room temperature because of the low pressure. A reliable, pressurized suit becomes an extension of the body itself. Add to that the extreme cold. There are records of temperatures plummeting to around minus 140 degrees Celsius. And because Mars does not have an active global magnetic field, the surface is more exposed to radiation than we are used to here. Less than in deep space, true, but still well above our safety standard. As if that weren't enough, there is still the dust factor. Winds that exceed 100 kilometers per hour lift very fine particles capable of wearing down mechanisms, scratching visors, penetrating seals, and above all, blinding solar panels for days, cutting energy generation in the blink of an eye. Given this set of obstacles, a trump card appears that can unlock almost all of the early stages, artificial intelligence. For decades, it lived in science fiction. Now, it is maturing at a pace that surprises even enthusiasts. And Mars is the perfect laboratory to put it to a real test. Think of it this way. It is not like the moon, where the script was to land, explore for hours or a few days, and return. On Mars, the trip is long, and the stay needs to be significant, long enough to be worth the risk. For that, when humans arrive, the initial camp needs to exist. Who prepares it? Autonomous robots, coordinated by AI systems, sent before the crew. There is a practical reason, and a human one for this. The practical. When someone lands after months in microgravity, the body struggles. The simple act of standing up, walking, and working in an environment with one-third gravity can be exhausting in the first hours or days. Having machines to unload cargo, assemble inflatable habitats, tune vital modules, 
deploy solar farms, and raise the first greenhouse makes the difference between an anxious arrival and a planned operation. The human, having intelligent local support, reduces the crew's physical and mental load in that transition period, allows focus on scientific tasks and strategic decisions, and turns survival into exploration. But it is not enough to send robots. They need to be truly autonomous. The communication delay between Earth and Mars varies with orbital geometry, easily reaching 10 minutes each way or even more. Translation, any questions sent by the team on Earth can take 20 minutes to go and return, and many critical things unfold in that interval. If an autonomous vehicle gets a procedure wrong out there, receiving the alert, analyzing it, and sending back a corrective command has already consumed too much time. That is why the state of the art in autonomy, perception, planning, execution, and real-time course correction stops being a luxury and becomes a requirement. The comparison with self-driving cars helps. On Earth, when a system hesitates, the driver takes over. On Mars, there will be no human driver outside, ready to grab the wheel. If, on the one hand, this raises the technological bar, on the other, it opens a promising path proving on Mars that autonomous systems can operate with safety, efficiency, and resilience gives us confidence to apply those same ideas here, improving logistics, transportation, energy, and infrastructure. The return is not only scientific, it is also economic and industrial. Medicine, in turn, has much to learn from Mars. We still don't know the cumulative effect of the sequence 1G, then months of 0G, and then 0.38G, then repeat on muscles, bones, the cardiovascular system, vision, and neuroplasticity. A round-trip mission, which can add up to years, will produce unprecedented data, some fascinating, others possibly concerning. We will need to think about specific post-Mars rehabilitation protocols, perhaps even centers dedicated to readapting returnees to Earth's gravity. And we need to face the possibility that certain damage may be partly irreversible for some profiles. Add to the equation background radiation. Outside Earth's magnetic bubble, the body accumulates doses of a cosmic cocktail whose long-term toxicology we do not master. The Apollo program, our only human precedent beyond the Van Allen belts, was short. And although many veterans age well, Buzz Aldrin's case became a symbol. The sampling and exposure do not allow us comfortable extrapolations. If the list sounds severe, there is a bright side. History shows that the space effort pays dividends in the clinic and the hospital. Technologies and procedures in areas such as robotic surgery, portable ultrasound, smarter pacemakers, imaging diagnostics, and even laser vision corrections have reaped benefits from the demands imposed by flights and missions. In simple terms, each big leap out there tends to pull a wave of innovations in here. Look ahead and the picture gets broader. The next human forays on Mars will demand coordinated solutions for water, heat, protection, and oxygen. Four pillars without which no base stands. Pumping ice from the subsurface, catalyzing CO2 to generate breathable oxygen and fuel, heating modules with monstrous efficiency, and designing habitats that are dust and radiation proof are tasks that will challenge engineers, geologists, doctors, biologists, and data scientists in equal measure. And, as has always happened in our history, we will learn by doing. Adaptation is a superpower of our species, but it works best when it is planned. In the background, the existential question hovers, why go? Why invest in this expensive and dangerous adventure when we have so much to solve here? One possible answer is pragmatic. Diversifying addresses is a survival strategy. Supervolcanoes, severe climate change, nearby supernovae, stubborn asteroids, or voracious pandemics make up a real list of events that can, at some point, seriously threaten the continuity of civilization as we know it. A sustainable presence on Mars would work as a backup for the species, a plan B we hope to never activate, but whose existence gives us more margin to correct course on Earth. Another answer is inspirational. Great projects unify generations, attract minds, and manufacture purpose. Even so, none of this gives us permission to neglect our backyard. Caring for Earth is an absolute priority. Exploring Mars is not an escape, it is an extension, the long road to what we can become. 
In the end, the Martian mission is exactly that, a collective test of engineering, science, health, autonomy, and species-wide sense. We will learn about materials and algorithms, about bones and neurons, about dust and wind, about courage and limits, and if we do it right, we will bring back something even more valuable than red rocks. The ability to solve gigantic problems in a coordinated way, with eyes on the sky and feet firmly planted on the ground. Perhaps Mars will be our first stop before we head to the edges of the solar system and, who knows, other stars. If this future intrigues you, leave a comment with what you think about all this. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, and share it. Thank you, and see you in the next video.